Hello, good morning, and uh, welcome again to our time of worship. I'd like to start with a reading from uh, Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 22. The time for making them pure came, as it is written in the law of Moses. So Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem. There they presented him to the Lord. In the law of the Lord, it says the first boy born in every family must be set apart for the Lord. They also offered a sacrifice. They did it in keeping with the law, which says a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, in Jerusalem, there was a man named Simeon. He was a good man who did what was right. He was waiting for God's promise to Israel to happen. The Holy Spirit was with him, and he told Simeon he wouldn't die before he'd seen the Lord Christ. The Spirit led Simeon to the temple court. Then Jesus' parents brought the child in, and Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God. Well, we can't physically take Jesus in our arms, but we can praise him, and we will do that in our first hymn, crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne.
Thank you to the uh, new Scottish hymn band for that. Why did I read that passage this morning? Well, Tuesday is Candlemas, and that's the celebration of uh, Mary's purification after the birth of Jesus, and it's also the presenting of Jesus uh, in the temple. Simeon said uh, Jesus is the much-needed light in a world of darkness. There was also uh, an elderly widow called Anna, and she spent all her time in the temple, and she prayed day and night, and she was also there at that occasion, and she gave thanks for God's Son. So let us do the same. Let's pray together on this Candlemas Sunday. Lord, we praise you for the quiet strength of Joseph, for the insight of Simeon, for the dedication of Anna, and for the courage of Mary as she faced the truth about her son. Make us bearers of your light, which lightens our world. So as we come from a place where nothing is certain or easy, we come to you and we can come in confidence and hope, knowing that we can rely on your presence and your power to guide and support us. So be our blessing in this worship time. Amen. So this was the beginning of preparing Jesus for his uh, short but extremely effective uh, ministry. Mary and Joseph would uh, no doubt head back to Nazareth where they would probably uh, do some homeschooling. Reminds me of a story, a little girl asked her Sunday school teacher um, why, uh, well she asked in Sunday school, why Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to Jerusalem anyway? 
And her friend re replied, uh, because they couldn't get a babysitter. Somebody else asked her why Jesus knew so much about the Bible. And the reply was, well, his dad did write it. Hopefully you'll find this an encouraging poem and it's called, Do Not Worry. Surviving, thriving, what about you? We keep being told all the things we can't do. Do not go too near people, do not go far from your house. It feels like life is a mouse trap and we're the mouse. No mask, no service, we feel so not in control. We respond by bulk buying soap and loads and loads of bog roll. We hear do not and it sounds so restricting. We're like, don't tell me what to do, I'll do my thing. But what if I told you some do not to make us free? It says in the Bible, open, see. In it we meet a man named Jesus, he's really rather special. But we're also told he's God and your mind give that a wrestle. But what does he say here you ask? It's simple yet profound, listen up class. It's three simple words, we can miss them if we hurry. These three words from Jesus, do not worry. But why does he say this? Can he mean this for us now? Can we take it seriously? Come on, really, how? How do we do this with all the uncertainty, angst, unknown? Well, the good news of the Bible is that there's someone on the throne. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, we find incredible verses that I personally adore. Do not worry where you'll find your food or drink. I wonder what your biggest worries are. Go on, have a think. Jesus goes back to basic. But for you, what does life bring? Our clothes, our bodies, Jesus says, don't worry about such things. With food and drink, he points us to the birds up in the air. God looks after them, he is a God who does care. And in the past, with all this worry about trouble and strife, who of you by worrying can add a single R to your life? With clothes, he points us to the flowers in the field. Yet look how beautiful they are, up unclothed, fully revealed. He talks about these things and he points to humanity, you and me. We're more valuable than birds and flowers in God's sight, you see. And whenever we know this, we're made to reflect Him and give Him glory. It gives us such purpose. That's definitely part of my story. And then he repeats, do not worry. Do not worry about what you will eat, drink or wear. Hopefully you see why this is a message I wanted to share. We all have worries, but we need to know more that God hears. He knows what we need. How encouraging is that for our ears? Look first for His kingdom, and all these things come as well. Jesus wants us to rely on God. That's where he wants us to dwell. And then he finishes with something that I'm sure you'll all agree. Whether you follow Jesus or not, you'll know this is key. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. This happens a lot with Jesus. What he says, simple, but mind blown. So we all worry and have things where we show over concern. But if Jesus is real and true, it should cause massive upturn. In a prayer Jesus teaches, he tells us to ask for daily bread. For us, we look beyond today, we look too far ahead. But bread is a good picture for us to hold. Because when you hear this, it's absolute gold. Jesus describes himself as the bread of life. Bread's a necessity for dinner. What Jesus is saying is, he's necessary, he satisfies, you're really on to a winner. So do not seems restrictive, but what about do not worry? Please, please, please don't pass by this message in a hurry. And what's your view of God and how he is depicted? For me, I see we may be, but God, he's unrestricted. So when you worry, where do you turn? I turn to Jesus, the one who shows real concern. Do not worry, put him first. He's the God who satisfies our ultimate thirst. I've seen this in my own life. It's something I definitely need to remember. It doesn't matter the month of the year, January, August, December. Perhaps the do nots we face today are for our good and well-being. It would link with what the Bible says and really be rather freeing. So with all this coronavirus and all of this restriction, what do you make of it all? God, fact or fiction? Christ alone, what is our only cause?
comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing I thought we could uh, listen and reflect on this uh, next hymn and uh, Bob Stewart will pray with us after that.
shall walk in endless joy. Heavenly Father, we come to praise and worship you this morning. We thank you for our relationship with you. We realise that you are a holy, omnipotent God, and if it were not for Jesus and him dying on the cross and taking away our sin, we could not approach you like this. We thank you that you answer prayer, not according to our will, but to yours. We are grateful that we live in a country where we have so much, but we know there are many people who have so little. So we give you thanks for the ministry of the food banks and the way people respond to helping their neighbours. We thank you for our Queen and her commitment to her Christian faith and the work she does. We also pray for the Royal Family and their ministry in our society. We commit to you our government and the many decisions they make. We know they don't always get it right, so that's why we pray you will give them wisdom and discernment on many critical issues. We pray for them particularly during this pandemic and also the decisions concerning Brexit. We praise you for the National Health Service and the way they have responded to this virus. Protect and encourage them in the coming weeks. For the care homes, the teachers and all those involved in our schools we will commit to you. So many have died to this coronavirus and it aches our hearts to see so much grief in, our, in your world. Help us to trust you as a nation and to turn our eyes upon Jesus. We think of the third world who have so little and yet they too are caught up in this pandemic. Help us as a nation to reach out to the poorer countries in ways that will enable them to see an end to these troubled times. We pray as Christians you will... We will support our brothers and sisters in lands where there is persecution and very little for them to live on. Again, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us. Help us to pass on the good news to our neighbours so that they too will know the joy of Jesus personally. We thank you for the eternal life that is ours as you trust him for the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we hear from uh, Pastor Bob, let's sing together, Holy, Holy, Are You Lord? Holy, Holy, Are You Lord? The
Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. If you have a Bible with you, perhaps you turn with me to Acts chapter 18, and we begin at verse 23. Acts 18, verse 23. After spending some time in Antioch, uh, Paul set, a, set out from there and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervour and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who, by grace, had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Last week, we finished on a high note. The Apostle Paul had completed his second missionary journey and he was back in his home church. There was familiar surroundings and warm fellowship. His stay, however, doesn't appear to have been for very long. If you look at verse 23 again, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, as Paul starts his third missionary journey, he does so alone. And this is probably because he's going to be covering familiar ground. And I think it's a mark of the man that saw him interested in pioneering new ground, but equally concerned to build the church and encourage believers to stand on their own two feet. Here's the purpose of his journey. It's all about training disciples this time. So how did he go about this? Paul understood that good foundations had to be laid and that the best possible foundations that believers can have is the word of God. Now, this is a stark reminder to us that we neglect the Bible at our peril. It is our authority and our guide for living. The Bible is, says Timothy Dwight, the window in this prison world through which we look into eternity. In John's Gospel, for example, in John 17, Jesus prays for his disciples. And as he's praying to the Father, he says, I'm saying these things in, in the world's hearing so that my people can experience my joy completed in them. I gave them your word. The godless world hated them because of it, because they didn't join in the world's ways just as I didn't join in the world's ways. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. They are no more defined by the world than I am defined by the world. Make them holy, con holy and consecrated with truth. Your word is consecrating truth. In the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. I'm consecrating myself for their sakes so that they will be truth consecrated in their mission. This is a gift that has been given to us by Jesus himself. And this is what builds us up as Christian believers. It is a knowledge of the word of God and obedience to it. You know, way back in Deuteronomy 6, it says, says everything. It expresses God's desire for his people to know him and to be like him. Listen to this. Love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love him with all that's in you. Love him with all you've got. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside your children. Talk about them whenever you, wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from time to time, from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them in your hands and your foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your homes and on your city gates. When I was reading this, I was reminded of a time when my wife and I had received a clear call from God to become missionaries. And we were getting ready to move on to full-time study. Then, after our first child was born, my wife suffered from a terrible postnatal depression. And life became different and very tough. And it got so bad that we thought that maybe we got it all wrong and maybe we should separate. Well, we sought some help, but nothing really helped. And I can remember sitting together, considering our future through all the tears 
and we decided that we would try and sort out our spiritual lives in the hope that we might recover something of our marriage. Well, we settled on a course called Survival Kit for New Christians. And in the booklet, there were several pages of tear-out cards with Bible verses printed on them. And we were encouraged to stick these cards above the kitchen sink, on the doors that we went through, by the shaving mirror, and actually anywhere where we would see them on a regular basis. And you know, it worked. As we read the scriptures, as we learned them, as we talked about them, we renewed our relationship with Jesus. And then we fell in love all over again. And this year, we celebrate 40 years of marriage. You see, the Lord understands our need to be relevant in our world. He gets that there are pressures to conform to questionable ethics and values. He sees the temptations that we have to shape his word to fit into our lives. But he wants us to understand and see and really get the fact that he's brought our salvation to liberate us from ourselves and to show us a way of life that is unfettered from the pressure to follow the crowd, be that religious or non-religious. Now, unless we grow up spiritually, there could be no effective mission or evangelism. And rather than be a growing church, we, can, we would just be an ageing Sunday school with all the associated problems of the immature. It's my impression that Paul, given his background, seeing the blindness of empty religion as it goes through its motions, really understood the dangers. And he set about educating and, and building the church so that it would get to know its saviour better and so survive. As if to demonstrate the time and commitment to his cause, Luke records another incident to help us to see it. And it's interesting, these things don't seem to be fitting together, but they do fit together. Look at verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervour and taught about Jesus accurately though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in a synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. With hindsight, we gain from reading our own Bibles. We know that Apollos is going to be an important addition to this new developing church. So it becomes extra special to us to see his story introduced to us and also to see how Paul's friendship and ministry will complement Apollos' own in the future. And that's what ministry is all about, isn't it? It's about laying foundations. It's about growing disciples. It's about growing the church so that it reflects God's ability to take ordinary human beings like us and do something really quite remarkable. The church was never meant to be about positions or personality but about knowing Jesus, about worshipping him and making his message of freedom from sin known to a world that is clearly devoid of hope. Now, Apollos, like Paul, had an education, but historically, unlike Paul, we know that he was a great or orator. Now, under his own steam, he'd followed the pattern that Paul and others had, and he'd gone straight to the synagogue to preach and debate that Jesus is the Messiah. Here we see Priscilla and Aquila enter the picture again. And graciously, they take him under their wing to help him to be the best he could be. And they're not very old as Christians either. Of course, they were to extend his theological education, particularly in regard to baptism. But this is more about fellowship and it's about support. And they possibly saw in him such potential so that they wanted to help him to be the very best he could be. And they make every effort to encourage him. And I think this is so lovely because everyone needs this kind of reassurance of the presence of God because none of us can take anyone further than we are ourselves. So as we grow, we grow others. Well, wouldn't you just have loved to have been a fly on the wall on that occasion? I wonder what they talked about, what they laughed about, what they cried about. And I'm guessing that they talked about baptism, about their testimonies, telling their stories of faith and their relationship to Jesus. But well, Apollos knew only the baptism of John. Now, that was quite a lot. It was the truth about Jesus, but it wasn't the whole truth. And the phrase we see, the baptism of John, 
means literally the message that John preached. John the Baptist's message in the wilderness before Jesus began his ministry was staggering for the folks of the day. It was so startling that people flocked in large numbers just to hear what he had to say. And one writer says of him, quite poetically, he was by no means an inferior man. He was a man of iron, a son of thunder. He roared like a young lion on his prey and feared the face of none. I love that. The truths he spoke were new, but they inspired hope and belief. He spoke of forgiveness from sin that was possible through repentance without the need to bring a sacrifice to the temple. And that the symbolic act of cleansing through baptism was a commitment to leave the old life behind and live a life devoted to God. He also pointed out that someone would come after him who would complete this work that he'd begun. I baptise with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. See, John made it plain to those listening to him that although they think he is of some consequence, they haven't seen anything yet. And where would the one that they're looking for come from? Well, from right amongst them, right under their noses. But they just haven't been looking in the right place. And John's comment, he's the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Now, to their understanding, this would have been devastating. Because the Talmud says, every office a servant will do for his master, a scholar should perform for his teacher, except loosing his sandal or thong. Now, imagine the shock of what they heard. He was a great prophet and according to Jesus the greatest of prophets who felt unworthy to render even the lowliest of services to Jesus. I wonder sometimes whether they look round frantically in the crowd to see if they could identify the person that he was speaking about. Priscilla and Aquila would have explained that repentance is just the beginning. As humans this is as far as we can go. Repentance might gain us forgiveness from our sins but the power to live this newfound belief and faith has now arrived. They would have shown him from the Old Testament and what it says about Jesus' death and resurrection. But they would also tell him now of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And this conf confirmation of what he knew and preached, but with new information, would help him to understand and realise that his faith doesn't rest on the predictions of the Old Testament, but by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. See, John Baptist knew his limitations, so, so should we. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals are not worthy to stoop and untie. I baptise you with water, said John, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's saying to them, look, after me, one will come who will go further. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. He will put new life into you. He will give you power to live the realities of, uh, of a faith relationship with him. And he will pour into you a pow the power it takes to live as God asks you to. I can't do that. You know, there are too many in this world today, even in the churches, who have been travelling this journey up until this point and stopped at the point of education. What they need to do now is move into experience. And we continue next week. Every blessing. My thanks to the uh, all male, male crew uh, today, the two Bobs and Ian. And uh, now it's time for our fellowship prayers. Let's pray together. Lord, we come a thankful people for the ways you've supported us through this uh, pandemic. We thank you for answered prayer for people and situations that we've prayed for. But we come with heavy hearts today, sharing in the loss of Joe and Mary's son, Jonathan. We hurt because of the awful grief, but we do remember that he's now with you and suffering no more. And so we pray for the family and all the families, and there are many who have suffered loss because of COVID. Lord, be their comfort. We pray for those vulnerable people who struggle with health issues every day. We remember them and anyone who may care for them. We thank you for the many people who have had their vaccines and we pray for those who are waiting. 
And we do thank you for the development that are occurring in the wonderful world of medicine. We remember, Lord, those who haven't had a particularly good week and especially we pray for uh, Mary Miller and we bring before you again Ben and Val and Simon, Bob and others known to you. We just ask you'd be close to them. As we look around, we maybe think there's not much good news about, but we thank you for the little things that work together for good for those who love you. And we trust and hope for our future in the Saviour who loves us. Amen. I trust you've enjoyed being with us today, and if you need to get in touch, obviously, please do. Our final hymn is This Is Amazing Grace. And it is.
close in prayer. The God we worship is our strength and joy. The God we serve is our courage and our reward. The God we trust is our hope and joy. He sends us out now to be salt and light, to declare his glory and to serve in his name. Amen. I'd like to leave you with a, a little treat from a man called David McRae. He's a local lad who went to a Bladen Comprehensive School and he's a member of St Luke's Church in Newcastle and uh, he performs in the Circular Church of All Saints at the end of the Tyne Bridge. He arranges all his stuff and he does a daily uh, Facebook performance. He studied at the Guildhall School of Music and judging by this arrangement of Amazing Grace, I think he must have been paying attention. So please enjoy and keep safe until the next time. Every blessing.